I can bend without any difficulty and turn left and right and my pain is gone. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled right now. Start to speak in a supernatural language, your heavenly tongue. Somebody watching this ball stones. The gall stones are going, they're going to pass out without causing issues, without causing pain, right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. I remove the conscience that testifies against you and tells you you're evil. And I release to you the mind of Christ which tells you you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're a son, you're a child. But what I want to talk about is that I felt like God was saying something new was happening. Okay? And I got the two messages the wrong way around, but I believe it was right. There's a new day. And of course, Isaiah says it in Isaiah, and he says it over and over again. A little bit lower, and He says, he talks about an Isaiah, and I think is it Isaiah 41? I think it is. It might be 43 verses 18 and 19. He says, there's a new day coming. Isn't that right? There's something new that is going to happen. It's Isaiah 43, 18 to 21. And then um, Isaiah 43, um, 18 to 21. Just go to 21. And uh, so let's just do it properly. <clears throat> okay, let's do it properly. We're not perfectionists. We just believe that doing it right glorifies God. Yes, Isaiah. Okay. Isaiah, it's because I'm trying to rush. Isaiah 43. Verses 18 to 21. God says, Behold, I do a new thing. He says, It shall spring forth now. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. In other words, I'm going to pour out my spirit. It's going to be so new. And though you don't see it, it's already happened. Is that okay? And um, the things of faith, you know, are always invisible. Spiritual things are always invisible. But, but, you know, um, God speaks about them a long time before they happen. And so there it is. You know that he'll give wat- waters in the wilderness yep. and rivers in the desert. And remember I said that a lot of what's happening with the COVID is a wilderness thing. It's a desert thing. But God is saying, um, in this thing, in the middle of this, I'm going to make a river. I'm going to pour out my spirit. Yeah. And, and, and there's going to be floods on the dry ground. And God will give to drink to my people my chosen. So now it might not be good news for the unchosen (laughs) or the not yet chosen, but for those who are chosen, God says, you're going to have plenty to drink. All right. He's going to satisfy the the people of God with so much. And then of course, um, was it, um, was it um, Psalm 30 verse 5? Was it Psalm 30 verse 5? Where he said, you know, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes with the morning. Is that okay? And so, and so we said, if it's a new day, a day has to start with the morning. So last week's message was, good morning. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for all those that greeted me this week on WhatsApp and on Facebook and said, good morning, Pastor John. And uh, echoing back the prophetic word. And then, of course, we got to put it together with the fact that the Lord says there's going to be a new or a fresh anointing that's going to be happening. New or fresh anointing. And so David said in Psalm 92 verse 10, he said, thou hast anointed me with fresh oil. Now, I don't want to repeat those messages, but I I feel like that I want to just take it on a little bit further and show you what I sensed uh, the last couple of days that God was speaking to me. Is that okay? And it started somewhere around about Wednesday And uh, this morning it was finalized uh, when the Lord woke me up at 18 minutes past three. And I'm saying that not to impress you with my spirituality, but so that you can feel sorry for me. But (laughs) at 18 minutes past three, during I was awake and I finished off the message. So um, the thing that I want to share with you is that there's something is about to happen. So anyway, we're hearing it more and more, but it's in the word anyway. The prophetic word only confirms the word of God. Is that okay? So one of the things that I want to just talk about, something that God always has or that God always 
takes. And so Habakkuk, I believe it's that Habakkuk tells us something um, so precious. He says, um, I'll get the reference now, um, where he says that um, the eyes of the Lord, um, I think it's not Habakkuk, it's 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. It says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And very much, you know, the Spirit of God is the eyes of God. He's in one place in Zechariah 3, he says, the seven, talking about the sevenfold eyes, you know, because it was a stone with eyes on it. It's the wisdom of God. But anyway, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And, and there's going to be words that you're going to hear repeated coming out. Is that okay? And, and I really need you to listen with attention, make notes, or do whatever. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Now, there are a lot of Christians that live in so much condemnation, they would read this verse like this. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, so he knows exactly what you're doing, so behave yourself and don't sin. That's what a lot of people would read that verse. But this is what God says. To show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Is that okay? So in other words, God is looking. God's eyes are ranging. Right throughout this COVID period, he's looking to the loyal hearts to show himself strong on your behalf. Come on, that's a good place to say amen. And so all throughout the Bible, the thing that God has or always takes is God always takes the initiative. God always takes the initiative. He's always, he always has and is always making the first move. So when Israel was in a bad place, he says, I want you to understand something. It's already begun. I've already taken the initiative. I'm, something is springing up that you haven't seen that is going to change everything. It's going to make everything new. I started it. Right in the book of, of Genesis, we see that when Adam and Eve sinned, God came looking for them. They were running and hiding. There was no initiative there. The initiative was a negative initiative. But God said, I'm coming, looking for you. And of course, the whole incidence around the fall, the promise of the seed. So God's eyes are ranging to and fro throughout the earth. And he finds an idol maker's son. I don't know what he saw in Abraham. But he goes and calls him and says, get out of this land. Let me take you to where a, a land that I want you to be in. And so starts all of redemption and the selection of the seed through the choosing of one man. God took the initiative. Come on, church. Say amen. amen. He took the initiative. Um, I like what um, Henry T. Blackaby says all throughout the Bible. This is one of the certain ways of God. He takes the initiative. Listen to this. And what he initiates. He completes. Yeah. Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. And, and as Christians, we firmly believe that. We know that, yeah. that God always takes the initiative. I mean, look at Noah, yeah. preacher of righteousness. God came looking for him because of the impending destruction that man's sins had brought upon themselves. And he says, I need someone to build me an ark. Yeah. He finds um, uh, Moses in the backside of the wilderness and calls him to go and yeah. deliver his people. God took the initiative. God acted first. Is that okay? So come on, church. You know, we can't brag, you know, well, I just had faith. Well, I just confessed. No, no, no. I mean, God was moving long before your confession and your faith. Is that okay? God was already doing something. And so Israel, if we, we look at the whole nation of Israel um, and what he did all the way through, you know, we, we, we see the character of God. We see the holiness of God. We see the love of God. We see the actions of God demonstrated in a nation. Um, and it brings us, of course, right up um, to the time of Jesus. God took the initiative, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish. God took the initiative. 
you know, that He sent His Son for us. Come on, church. Whatever it is that is breaking forward, breaking forth now, and we really know what it is, God took the initiative. It wasn't our fancy prayers even during lockdown. It wasn't even our desperations. It wasn't anything like that. God took the initiative. It didn't take Him by surprise, but He was already moving. Is that okay? It's a good place to say amen or hallelujah or something like that. Come on, just look at your own life. Just look at your own life. Consider your own life. Think about your own life. Um, all of us can say, everything that happened in my life or our lives, God took the initiative. Because through the Holy Spirit, God's initiative continues in all of our lives. And every one of us have had words and, and, and in impressions, have had the leading of the Holy Spirit, have had chance encounters, negative circumstances, positive circumstances. We came out the other side and we discerned that God was busy through all of it. Because he took the initiative some way. Amen? And so um, I like what um, John Wesley said. He said, these initiatives are the prevenient, a fancy English word, are the prevenient grace of God in our lives. Our faith then is simply a response to the divine initiatives of God. So this is what Blackaby says. If prevenient is a new word for you, it simply means this. It's an old English word. It means this. God went before you. Yeah. Isn't that right? Amen. God has gone before you. God has gone before you. God's already way ahead. That's his prevenient grace. Yeah. Is that okay? He's taken the initiative a long time ago. He took the initiative. And, and when we discover the fact that God has taken initiative, the response, our response is, is one of faith. And Shireen preached a beautiful message on faith this morning. Is where we're just responding to God. And we're responding to His initiative. Is that okay? And so faith then becomes a response to the initiative of God. So I want us to, we're going to concentrate on Psalm 37. And we're going to just talk a little bit about the correct responses. Is that okay? And it will all be classified under faith. Everybody ready? This is a bit of a teaching word this morning. Are you good? Yes. Pan, tilt, <laughs> zoom. So Psalm 37, I want you to turn to Psalm 37. In the, some of the Bibles and some of the commentaries and things, they call this a no fret psalm. No fretting. In other words, no, no anxiety. No, a no worry psalm. Is that okay? So... It's a no worry psalm. It's a no fret psalm. But I want to talk about something else. You see, um, when God takes the initiative and we respond, it's very much a cause and effect situation. Cause and effect. Okay? Cause and effect. Everybody say cause and effect. God is the cause and has an effect on us. And the effect is one of response. Is that okay? Yes. okay? I love it. Cause and effect. And we're going to go through something, and then I'm going to make a comment about it. But let's just read from Psalm 37 and verse 1. Fret not thyself. <laughs> is that good? Yes. It's King James. Fret not thyself. So just say out loud to somebody near you, say, don't fret. Say, so don't panic. Say, so don't worry. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. I mean, how apt is that for the period of time that we're in? There's all kinds of theories. Somebody was telling me this now this morning. There was somebody who was in this church, and he's going around, and his big conspiracies, and Trump is sent from God, and Putin, and they're working together, and, and, uh, <laughs> and together they're taking down the Illuminati and the deep state and all of this kind of thing, and he's God's anointed, and... And, you know, and there's, there's conspiracy upon conspiracy upon conspiracy. Years ago, we used to listen to all those, um, Mark Temperato and the others, and they would all go around talking about the dangers of rock music. Yep. Now, I, I listen to rock music. I don't find anything demonic about it. It's quite anointed to me. But anyway, it's a matter of perspective, I guess. But I love rock music. And then they would all go into it, and it's like, the backward masking, and if you play this record backward, it goes, all of a certain, all of a certain. <laughs> when you turn the record backwards, and, and there's subliminal messages, and maybe it was the early days of doing that. I don't know. 
But I mean, we were so down on all the rock stars, and then they moved on to your toy box, and then get the devil out of your toy box, and then, you know, then the kids couldn't have Masters of the Universe toys and Ninja Turtles because of this, and oh my word. And it went on and on and on and on, and, and then everything was demonic. I mean, it was bad, you know? And then I remember, um, then I used to love the Smurfs. Then when somebody taught about it and was like, Smurfs, you know, they came up with a Smurfology about Smurfs. And I was like, oh, no, we can't even watch Smurfs. And I went, then gummy berries. Oh, it's because they drink the juice, you know, Jesus is, you know, oh, Lord Jesus. It was so bad. I repented. I've apologized to my kids because I went to them and I'm telling them, you know, because I was influenced by those people, you know, like the masters of the universe, you know, you're teaching your kids that, you know, because Jesus is the master of the universe. So I did a nice little sermon for my kids and shame. They packed up all those toys and threw it in the dustbin. The thing that hurt me the most was flipping expensive. And you're chucking them in the bin. And so they went on and on and on. And everything was demonic. Everything was devilish. We went through a phase where Bev loved little owls and little frogs. And so then, so we had pot plants in the house. And then we had all these little owls and all these little frogs. And you ribbit, you know, all these little green little frogs from ribbit. And they were just cute. And then some of these deliverance people came to us. Oh, skanda, Pastor John and Bev, you got demonic things in your flower pot. No, no, they're porcelain. They're, they're you know. So now we're chucking out the, <laughs> oh my word. So how did I get onto this? So I'm watching, I, I, you know, all of these things. And eventually I get invited to a pastor's fraternal. Yeah, they get this guy, he's saved, and he used to be in the rock music world. And he comes up and he says, hey, brothers, lighten up on these rock musicians and rock stars. You know, they don't have demonic intent. They lost they just unsaved. Preach Jesus to them. Stop condemning them. I was like, yes, is my man. That was it. Frogs back. Master of the universe back. I was back. They just, come on. Maybe there is a thing going on. They lost. These people are unsaved. They will be used. Come on. Let's, let's get out of some of the nonsense that's going on. Okay, so fret not thyself because of evil doers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. It's amazing how we can be envious of the world's success and the yes. world's wealth. Yes. And he says, don't be envious, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Now, I want to tell you, in Catholic theology, this is the key kingpin psalm that they hold up that the day is coming when there will be a role reversal and the church will be the blessed and the unrighteous will not. Read the whole psalm, and you'll see why. And they say, and it's in Catholic theology, they hold this true to the fact that there's coming a justice, and the righteous will be the prosperous ones. The righteous will be the successful ones. The righteous will be the healthy ones. And, and they will have seen that the glory of God is upon the church. All the verses, arise, shine, for your light has come. Amen? And, and so there's coming a time when the things are going to change. So... One of the things that uh, David talks about in the psalm, he talks about on this, this um, cause and effect thing, on this, the fact that God has taken the initiative. And listen, all of this is going to happen, and God has really taken the initiative for it. Is that okay, Chase? Are, are we all good? Are we all in the same place? And so, so let's just talk about the fact that God is the cause, all right? And, and we've looked at it the last two weeks. Now we're going to do, um, we're going to do the effect so listen to what verse 3 says. The first three says, trust in the Lord. Good. How many of you can see this is an effect? This is a, a response. So trust in the Lord. I just love this. So trust in the Lord is number one. And he says this. The word trust means to rely on. It means to move your dependence it's to shift weight almost. And basically what it is is to move all of your trust out of an economy, to move all your trust out of a finance, out of finance, out of investments, out of your job. It's talking, and you'll see what he says a bit later, is to shift the whole weight of where we put our dependence and, and we move it over to God and it's to rely on him. And he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Everybody say, do good. Now that's um, a consequence, a follow-out 
of trust. Doing good. You can go to Titus, for example. The whole book of Titus, Paul says to Titus, teach your people to do what is good. The whole, the whole epistle. And everything, this morning, what you're doing right now is good. It's sitting here. Just now you gave. That's good. We serve one another. Washing the feet of saints. That's a good work. Is that okay? And so God says, trust me and continue to do what you're doing that are good works. Is that okay? I've got a lot to say, so I can't. I mean, I would love to preach a whole message just on that. But I can't because of time. But look at this. And it says, so shalt thou dwell in the land. I looked it up. And in the commentary says, the tense is um, not a suggestion. The tense is a command. And basically it says, trust in the Lord and do good. This is how it would read in the original. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Yeah. Awesome. Amen. Is that okay? Dwell in the land. So he's given a command, dwell in the land. So what does that mean, to dwell in the land? It means that God is basically saying, well, then live there. And the, and the implication is you will prosper enough to live there. You'll be blessed enough to live there. You'll be successful enough to live there. You'll be protected enough to live there. Come on, church. This is good. And he says, and verily thou shalt be fed. yoo Another result. The word fed there, if we look at the context, yes, it's physical provision. But more than that, what God is saying is you'll be fed truth. You'll be fed revelation. I, I will reveal myself to you. So, so that's good cause and effect. Is that okay? So we're still on verse 3. So we're still on verse 3. So trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land. And you'll be fed. I mean, you can just see... Um, you know, sequential things. You can just see how the unfolding of trusting in the Lord is in itself a cause and effect thing. Can you see what I'm saying? So we respond to God, and it takes us on and on and on and on. Okay, you're getting tired already, and I've still got time. Are you all listening? You just yeah, okay? You're just saying amen in your hearts. Okay. So now the second thing is this. Point number two. I love it. And now he says in the next verse, in verse, uh, verse three, verse four, delight thyself. Also in the Lord, in all your trusting, enjoy God. Delight yourself. Delight yourself also in the Lord. So these are all in the Lord. So I'm going to just say delight for, for um, sake of time. Delight thyself in, also in the Lord. So delight. It's very amazing that the, the word delight is a very feminine word in the original very feminine. It's very it's delicate, and it's almost like um, like putting makeup on and you know all that kind of thing. It's just delicate, and 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 the interesting thing about it is, it it really is to delight yourself in the Lord. But it it, it talks of tenderness. It talks of something that has captured all of your emotions. Delight thyself in the Lord. Does it, does it find that good? I love it. You delight yourself in the Lord, and this is and He will give you the desires of your heart. Come on, church. So often we're complaining. And God hasn't answered my prayers. God isn't. <clears throat> Let's ask the obvious question. Are you delighting yourself? It's another factor, isn't it? Delight yourself in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. So, point number one is to trust. Point number two is to delight thyself in the Lord. And um, um, Job 22, verses 21 to 28. Are you all going to, should we listen? It's, it's just amazing. I want you to catch words, okay? Catch words, underline words, catch words. In Job 22, he says, Acquaint now thyself with him. In other words, get to know him better. Thereby, good shall come unto thee. It sounds a little bit like delight thyselves in the Lord. Isn't that right? And what's going to happen? Good will come to you. He says, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words in thy heart. It's one of the things that I spoke about last week. 
And so receive his instruction, receive his word, get to know God. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Listen to this. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. In other words, what Job is saying is, take your trust, don't rely on the abundance or whatever, and put it in the Almighty. Is that okay? He says, go and bury it somewhere in the sand, but take your trust out of that. He says, yea, the Lord Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver, for then shalt thou have thy delight in the Almighty, and shall lift up thy face unto God. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. In other words, everything you are supposed to do, you will be able to do it. Let's put it this way. You'll be able to pay your bills. Listen to this. Listen to this. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Woo! Listen to this. And the light shall shine upon thee thy ways. Come on, church. Come on. Listen to me. Listen to me. So many people want to stand and prophesy. I decree and declare. I decree and declare. Well, how about the above? How about delighting yourself in the Lord? How about acquainting yourself? Because it's not a formula. It's not a mantra. It's something that comes out of a relationship. Is that okay? Delight yourself in the Lord. Because a lot of Christians are like that. Everything's a mantra. Everything's a, a little, you know, repetition. So, and that's why God looked at Israel and says, hey man, your lips, it sounds fantastic what's coming out of your mouth, but let's check your heart. Nah, it's far from me. Is it okay? Acquaint yourself with the Lord. It's tender. So in other words, fall in love with Him. Delight yourself in the Lord. Isaiah 58 verse 14. The whole psalm is about just doing the right thing, doing His Word. And Jacques sent this to me this week, and that was part of the triggers for this message. He said, Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And, and the Lord says, I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee there with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Can I have an amen somewhere? Can I just, you know, like, woo-woo. <laughs> I was getting myself blessed all day yesterday and all morning this morning from 1803. And, and I mean, you can go to Isaiah 55 verses 1 and 2. You can go to Isaiah 66. You can go to different places where it talks about delight thyself in the Lord. And, uh, of course, here it is in Psalm 37. Okay? So delight thyself in the Lord. So all the pluses. Isn't it amazing? Your prayer will hear you. You'll be able to fulfill all of your vows, your promises. You know the contracts you sign, the debit orders. You'll be able to fulfill them. You'll start pro prophesying and decreeing a thing when there isn't enough. And God says, you know, I, I, I'll give you all the prophetic things that you are prophesying if you will delight yourself in me. Point number three. For the sake of time. Point number three. He says, trust. He says, delight. Then in verse five. He says, commit. Verse 5. Whee! Commit. Commit thy way unto the Lord. You know, it's a lot of believers, they are prepared to commit their way unto the Lord until they see that when they commit their way to the Lord, it clashes with their idea of things. And then suddenly, my wisdom sounds a whole lot better. Because then I can put it in the credit card. Or I can get into debt for a thing. Or showers by, you know, I've got to do things a little bit of a different way. In other words, there has to be a delay. There's not instant gratification, you know. I'm sure God won't mind. Mm -hmm. Commit thy way unto the Lord. So in other words, listen to this. Basically, a lot of times, commit thy way unto the Lord. I love it. Commit thy way unto the Lord. So in other words, a lot of times, I want to do my will in His name, and He must bless it. But God says, do my will in my name, and then I'll bless it. The word commit comes from a Hebrew word, same root um, is translated Gilgal. 
And it was when Joshua and the children of Israel got to that place of Gilgal that a circumcision had to take place there because the men under 40, had, uh, under 40 had not yet been circumcised. The first generation had. They came to Gilgal and God said, you have to, you have to circumcise all those 40 years and younger. And he said, because today I roll away the reproach of Egypt. Yeah. The word commit means to roll and so when David says, commit your way unto the Lord, he's saying, take your way and all your plans and roll it onto God. But, but, but you need to roll his plans onto him. Not your plans. You know, if it's contrary to the word. Roll your plans onto him. And when you do, trust him, first point, and he shall bring it to pass. Is that okay? You know, there's too many people who go like, you know, I, I want to marry that lady. And God says, no, don't, don't marry that one. You know, but I want to. No, don't marry that one. You know? And so we, we, we I want whatever. whatever. You know what I'm talking about. But we need to do it God's way. Is that okay? We need to do what God says. Seek first the kingdom. And so when you do, then you commit that to God. And he goes like, you're doing what I, I want you to do. Well, it has to be successful. Is that okay? Yeah. Commit thy way into the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Yeah, that's awesome. So he'll bring it to pass. Man, oh man, oh man. So he'll bring it to pass. The fourth response. I want you to notice God has taken the initiative. God has already moved. God has already said it's a new day. God has already said it's a good morning. God has already said there's a new anointing. Is that okay? Another prophet says it this way. He says it's a dawn of a new era. Fresh mantles are falling. Is that okay? I don't see that mantles are falling. I see that they're fallen. I see that we pick up mantles. Is that okay? Because the mantle of Christ has fallen. So we pick it up. Okay, great. So, so I, I want you to notice this. With all of this, God takes the initiative. So our response is faith. And Shireen preached on that this morning. Our response equals faith. There's a, a sense in which if we start from there, these are components of faith or aspects of faith. Is that okay? But I want you to notice they're almost in escalating sequence. He starts with says, trust me. Well, if you trust him, you're going to delight in him. Because once you've tasted, you'll see that the Lord is good. Once you delight in him, well, you start to see, man, his ways are better. He's got greater wisdom than I have. So I started to commit all my ways to God. I mean, all the responses, all the things are phenomenal. Is that okay? It is absolutely amazing. So commit your way unto the Lord. It's really interesting that point number four, he says, okay, now rest. In the Lord. Rest in the Lord. What do you say, rest? Say, rest in fear. Rest in peace. All right? Rest in the... Is this okay? Have I stunned you into silence? Or is this the right message? Okay. So rest in the Lord. The word rest there in the Hebrew means to be silent. In other words, quit grumbling, quit fretting, quit moaning, quit whinging, quit panicking. Don't worry. Be happy. For the Lord your God is with you. Is that okay? So it's to be silent, to stand still. Remember when God brought Moses and the people of Israel out, and they were one side the wilderness, the other side the sea, behind them was Pharaoh and the armies, and everybody is panicking. And God says to Moses, just stretch out your rod. Just stretch. Don't complain. Don't cry. He, he goes, rest. Just hold out the rod. Because the enemy you see today, You'll never see again. What did he do? He stood in rest. So Psalm 46 is a powerful, powerful psalm. In Psalm 46, talking about rest, verses 7 to 10, I mean, you can read the whole psalm. But in Psalm 47, he says, um, I think it's verse 4, there is a river whose streams, streams make glad the city of God. God is within her. She shall not fall. Come on, church. 
You. There's a river coming from God. It's the way in the wilderness. It's the new thing that was springing forth. It's in your wilderness, whether you see it or not. It's already flowing. Is that okay? And he goes, you know, there's a stream whose rivers, rivers. In other words, there's a stream for every one of us, equal size with the original stream. Stream, stream, stream. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is within her, within you. You shall not. And then he talks, though the nations quake and these surgings and these all kinds of things. And, and then he goes on to say this, and I think it's in verse 10. He says, be still, be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. So be still, be still. You know, if we perceive that God has taken the initiative and our response is faith, we can say, okay, God, well, Shireen shared a beautiful testimony um, a, a great miracle that just happened. A friend of Ian's, a work friend, his father had a heart attack at a racetrack now just recently, and he phoned Ian from the racetrack, and he said, hey, but please pray my dad's just had a heart attack. He was out. And uh, um, um, ICU surgery nurse um, was on, and she was giving him CPR. They eventually threw him in the back of the bucket. It was 40 kilometers or 40 minutes to the nearest hospital, and she's doing CPR, and he's praying and panicking and all this kind of thing, and suddenly, you know, a ray of better hope came over the horizon, and he realized, I'm stressing and struggling here. This ain't my responsibility. And he, he stopped, and he changed his whole prayer, and he said, God, this is not my responsibility. You said you would heal him. Now you heal him. Because he was panicking and shouting, Dad, Dad, stay with us, Dad. And he realized, oh, it was a little, a little strong thing to say. He said, okay, Lord, okay, you heal him. And then suddenly a groan. Her, the theater nurse, her first, first Sunday there ever because she'd never been. So she was positioned in the right place at the right time, sent of God. And she's still doing CPRs. But when, when he said, okay, Lord, this is not my responsibility. Your responsibility is to heal. Now you heal him. And he said a groan came out of his dad. The theater nurse was panicking because she thought this was, okay, now he's giving up the ghost. But, the, but he took it as a positive sign going, oh, awesome, he's coming around. When they got to the hospital, of course, all the theater staff and everybody. The long end of the story is this. A couple of days later, they're running on the beach together. Come on, give God a hand for that. That's really awesome. And so, and so be still. Woo! Be still and know that I'm God. It's not just a casual, flippant, okay, I'm going to stop him. He's, no, he's God. You know, this guy, Gerard, did it out of desperation, but he did the right thing. It's to be still and know. It's acknowledging and understanding who God is. Okay, God, I step back. Amen. Come on. Be still and know that he is God, despite COVID and all those kind of things. Let's just step back because he says it's a new day. He says, I'm doing a new thing. He says, I'm releasing a fresh anointing. He's taken the initiative. I don't know about you, but, but I'm, I'm excited, I, and I'm not putting it on for your sake. I'm excited. Yeah. Amen? I can't wait to see. I keep talking to the Lord about this. I keep talking to the Lord. I keep telling Him. Come on, church. There's outstanding things that God has showed me. I've been in revival. We've, we've been the ones that God used and placed us for the, and the nation of Armenia and other places where I've been where revival has broken out. So I, I know what it is. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking, about from, I'm not talking from history books. I'm not thumb-sucking about something that I haven't seen. I've lived it and experienced it in this church in 1994. Is it okay? Amen. A move of God that transcends anything that you could imagine. I know what revival is all about, and I know it's coming. So one day, one day, I wake myself up praying in tongues, laughing, early hours of the morning, three o'clock in the morning. Ha ah, ah, ha have this have this vision, but it's yeah, it's not a dream, it's a vision. And in this vision, I'm in the car with Prophet Quirbus, and we're driving, he's driving. We're in England. We're driving on one of those cobbled streets like you see, for example, in York or in Guildford, the city of Guildford, cobbled old Roman road. And we're coming up 
on the hill, and as we look towards the city, it's got a, a bell tower, you know, uh, like a, it's a clock tower, and, and it's like those, those ancient ones, you know, square, with the, the sort of the cutouts, the turrets on top, the ramparts, and we're driving, and we're looking towards it, and, and I can vaguely see what the time is, and as we're driving, Prophet Quibus and I are excitedly talking about this coming move of God. We're talking about the fact that it'll have the power like the early preachers in America when they preached. They would stand in different places because there was thousands and thousands of people, no sound systems. And they would stand up, each man standing, preaching a message. And they say it looked like a battery of field guns opened up the way the people were mowed down under the power of God. We were talking about, yeah, it's hard for me to talk about this. The holiness, the, the miracles of John G. Lake. We're talking, we're excited. Hey, Alan, William Branham, the angel of the Lord, we're talking about all these things. And we're so excited because inside of us there's this knowledge that when we get to that tower, we've got it. We're in it. And we're driving and we're looking, we're talking, and we, we, we're stumbling over our words and we're reminding ourselves of all of these things that were happening and that have happened that, that we want to happen. And we come near the, the, the tower and I look up and it's just, just one minute to 4 p.m. That, that minute hand is about to go to 4 o'clock. And I wake myself up Praying in the Spirit, and I'm saying, on the 24th of the 4th, at 4 p.m., we have revival. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I wanted to phone Prophet Quibus. He probably would have been awake because he, he uh, could survive on minutes of sleep, you know, not hours. And I phoned him in the morning. I looked up, I looked up all combinations, 424, John, I looked up. Every Bible verse, I couldn't find anything. I went through nearly the whole Bible, looking at 24 4 and you know, 4 24, and you know, couldn't find it. So I phoned Prophet Kribbis and I said, Does 24, the 24th of the 4th, mean anything to you? He starts laughing. He said, Brother, my whole life is about the 24th of the 4th. Wow. Every significant prophetic word I had was where God said, Note this day, and it was the 24th of the 4th. Wow. And it was, he said, I've got a whole sermon on it. I'll show you when you come. And he said, why? And he said, I had this dream. He said, let's do a meeting, because the Sunday evening meetings were at 4 p.m. Yeah. Andre and, and Marius helped us. We hired several buses, and we packed the whole of ACFN. We drove through. And, and the, the, that day, somebody took a photograph of it. And that's why I know we're still approaching the time. We had a great meeting. But I shared it with Prophet Kervis. He was so excited. We were beside ourselves excited. And the clock tower in Silfontein looks just like the clock tower in my vision. And the time stopped that day. The time stopped at quarter to four. The clock stopped working quarter to four. It was almost like God saying, not yet, but it's coming. Do you not perceive it? Even now, it springs forth. Come on, church. Can I have an amen? I'll, I'll rush. I feel it's important to say this. I was going through this the other day, just meditating a little bit of God's initiative in my life. In the olden days when there used to be a side wall here and there was a, church, a door here, one morning I came early in the morning. I think it was the weekend I was supposed to be with Prophet Kervis. The Lord told me to come home and be in our church. And somebody, I think Shireen, was going to preach. So I thought, well, I'll get up and go to the church normal time. I got up at five. I was here just before six. I thought, I'll pray until they arrive, and then I'll go home and change. And when I got to the door, because this is more or less where that door used to be here, so I had the key, you know, made sure the alarm was off, put the key in the door. Well, as I approached the door to put the key in, I could hear voices inside, inside the building. And I stood and listened, and I thought, there's nobody here unless someone's broken in. And then I started thinking, maybe the band came early, and they're going to give me a fright when I open the door. They're going to go boo or something. 
So I stepped away from the door, and I looked around. I thought, no, man, it's too early. I looked. There's no cars. There's no cars. I went back to the door to put the key in, and I could hear this excited conversation. I thought, no, man. So I walked further around. I walked around and looked under the carport. There's nobody there. So I came back and I was about to put the key in because I thought, well, I'm going to open the door quick and I'm going to run him and go, boo, give them a fright. And as I came again to put the key in, I started to make out the conversation. I started to hear this talk about revival. I started to hear and I suddenly realized it's the cloud of witnesses. It, it, it's some of those revivalists. And as I'm listening, I'm, I'm hearing them say, and, and this happened, and this happened. Come on, I've goosebumps everywhere. And this happened, and this happened, and, and, and we're going to see this, and we're going to see this, but it's all going to be put together in one revival. One. And I was like, yo, it's the cloud of witnesses. I put the key in, opened the door, ran in. It was pitch dark in here, and I stopped. I stopped about here and was quiet. And I started to shout, keep talking. I want to hear, keep talking. Come on, church. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Come on, laughing's better than crying. Oh. <laughs> That's the river whose streams make glad the city of God. Woo! The only place where the most hard. <laughs> Woo! Shh. I dare you all just to give a little giggle. Ha <laughs> Come on, laugh with. Ah. Isaiah 64, verse 4 says Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts. On behalf of those who rest, wait for him. Come on, church. Yeah. Thank you, Godfrey. Keep laughing. You bless me. Yeah. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Woo. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up. Mount up on wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. How many of you know that supernatural strength, that supernatural energy, the ability to run and to walk comes from? It's the response. Come on, church, I want to say something. God, I'm going to be taking up some space, but I'll move it over to there. God responds. To your response. God is a responder. Can I have an amen? I need to compose myself because I'm I'm on the inebriation line, I'm moving along rapidly. <laughs> so God responds to our response. He initiates it. When we respond, He responds. Come on, this is so awesome, man. Yeah. And then He goes, point number five, moving rapidly along. God, I got to squash it in because I wrote that, but it's fine. Then God says, cease. Stop. That was a very positive word. Cease means cease and desist. Stop. And he tells us in Psalm 30, <laughs> 37, he says, cease from anger. Now, why? Why does he say this? Why does the psalmist say this? Well, because he's referring, the context is, the, the wicked seem to be blessed, the righteous not. And he's saying, don't get angry about it. In other words, don't respond, respond wrongly in situations and circumstances 
respond correctly. Is that okay? Because cease from anger is more of a reaction. Faith is more of a response. Is that okay? So he says, respond to the right things. So cease from anger and wrath and things like this. So you can go from Ephesians 4 right into Ephesians chapter 5. And from verse 25, you know, Paul talks about in your anger, sin not. Don't get angry. Don't get, don't, don't get into all kinds of wrong expressions of anger. Anger needs to be that. If there is anger, it needs to be righteous anger. But he goes all the way through into Ephesians chapter 5, and he says, don't get filled with wine where is an excess. In other words, don't go this way and get angry, you know, and, and take matters in your hand. But then also don't go, you know, despondent and start drinking to try and lift yourself. Don't, you know, to two extremes. And he says, rather step out of all of that and be filled with the Spirit. Is it okay? Correct response to situations. More of you, Jesus. More of your Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus, fill me now. Fill me now. Fill me, Lord. Here's my cup. Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. You see, and those are all revival songs going, God, I need more of your spirit. Cease and desist. Respond in the right way. Get more of the Holy Ghost. Is that okay? And so, man, and be filled with wine. But we're in, anyway, verse 10. For yet a little while, listen to this. And the wicked shall not be, yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. In other words, even if you take a fine-tooth comb, even if you take a microscope, even if you diligently go looking for the place of the wicked, he says, you're not going to find it. Good news. Good news, church. I know it's time, and it's hard to say amen now because it's over time. But I'll pay you over time for all your amens. But listen to verse 11. Listen to verse 11. Verse 11. I am sure we've read this somewhere before. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of the shalom of God, the peace of God. Nothing lost, the peace of God. Nothing stolen, the peace of God. Nothing broken, the peace of God. Nothing missing, the peace of God. Nothing out of place, the shalom of God. We'll delight ourselves in the abundance of peace. So, Matthew chapter 5, onwards, Jesus spoke about this kingdom of his. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He goes on in verse 5 to say, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Where did he get it? He knew Psalm 37. And so, and I'm going to write it over here, just right at the bottom. Because I'm going to connect it all together now. And you're going to get revelation upon the revelation. So Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5, he says, The meek, and I'm, I won't fill it in all, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Okay? And everything that is in the world, inherit the earth. Okay, you're all watching, church. The meek shall inherit the earth. Now I'm going to fly through the rest of the psalm in one minute. Are you all listening? Yep. Shout amen at the appropriate places. The Lord shall laugh at him. That's the wicked. For he seeth that his day is coming. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Amen. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine shall they be satisfied. Amen. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. And they, shall, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Amen. He delighteth in his way. Amen. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Amen. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. Now that judgment there is his righteous judgment. In other words, the judgments that, make, that God makes about us, which is the whole psalm. You're going to be blessed. You're going to inherit. I will be merciful to you. Those are the judgments of God. Is that okay? So for the Lord loveth the judgments and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Once again, verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land 
and dwell in there, therein forever. Verse 31, the law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Verse 37, mark the perfect man. Mark. Mark them. Note them. Note the righteous men and women of God. And behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust Him. Is that, can I hear an amen? amen? So it's a new day. It's a new, fresh anointing. God has taken the initiative to initiate. It wasn't because we are so fancy, clever, hungry, full of faith, prayed so hard. But when we responded, when we responded, God is responding to the response. Is that okay? So he's responding, and faith is the appropriate. And so David starts outlining it in a really wicked time. The, the, the God who's taken the initiative, and, and we've responded. But he notes all the responses of God to their responses. And he starts to say, trust in the Lord, delight in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord, rest in the Lord, cease and desist from reacting and start acting in faith. Woo. In ascending order, it's escalating order. Is that okay? Amen. So in other words, that's, that's the point that we arrive at, where we cease from all other things, and we're at a calm and we trust God. Are you ready? Let's just wrap it up. So all of this stuff here, from here down to here, is another way of saying meekness. Blessed, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. <laughs> God, this was such a revelation for me. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. Strength under control. I love, Andre shared that the other week. And uh, the bridled horse has got so much power, but he submits to the rider. It's power, but meekness is the power under control. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like I sense that God, on the meekness, if we do this, is dropping the reins and saying, go for it, sons. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Go for it. Go for it, saints. It's a response to our response to his initiative. Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah. Should we stand? Should we stand? Should we stand? Come on, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Who are the meek? It's us. It's you. Blessed are the meek. For you shall inherit the kingdom. <laughs> I don't even know how to end this. I was just, I'm so, so enjoyed it. I'm a bit, I'm a bit sozzled. Just, just raise our hands. Maybe that, we must just play that saying, God of revival. I think you had it when we came in. And thanks. God of revival. Come on, just let's lift our hands. Let's just, yeah, come on, just respond to the word in faith. Just respond afresh and say, okay, God, would you do it? Do it, do it, do it. Do it, Father. Do it, Father. Do it, do it. Do it, Lord. Do it. Father, do it, do it, do it. Do it, Father. Do it, Lord. Do it, do it, do it. Oh, I pray.